Hello folks, Ninjago is like one of the coolest LEGO series ever. It's not just about building stuff, it's got its own TV show, games, theme parks, and more. So, in this video, I'm gonna spill the beans on how this whole thing came to life, from 2011 up to now. And hey, don't forget to hit subscribe, and enjoy the show. Let's rewind back to 1978. There's this set code 375 called Castle. It was like the first big deal in LEGO history kicked off this massive lineup known as Castle. Fast forward two decades to 1998, and bam, on the shelves you've got this new vibe, ninjas. But forget medieval Europe. This time, it's all about feudal Japan. No knights in armor. We're talking samurais and ninjas rocking kimonos. Designers got creative with masks, a kabuto helmet thing, and katanas, all later added to the Ninjago theme. Now, the franchise story kicks off in 2009. It's a chill Friday evening in fall, and Tommy Andreasen doodles six minifigures, the ninja team and the sensei. Alongside the four main elements these made-up characters got, Water makes a cameo in his drawing. But hold up, in the first sets, Water isn't all buddy-buddy with any ninja. Turns out, the plan from the get-go was to have Water ninjas in the crew, but Tommy brought that to life fully around 2015. Actually, the idea to make a cool medieval Japan Lego thing started way before 2009. Let me show you this drawing that happened in 2004, thanks to this guy Mike Rayhawk. So, according to what Mike was thinking, this Lego theme was all about ninjas fighting skeletons for the right to have golden weapons. Dragons were also part of the story, and, you know, there's one right there in the concept. At first, it might look like Tommy just copied the whole thing, but there are some differences between what he did and what Mike came up with. First off, Mike's idea had heroes as skeletons, not ninjas. It's a kind of weird but cool idea that, unfortunately, never happened. Second, the ninjas in Mike's vision weren't normal people, they were ghosts, led by an evil sorceress. And the regular folks were just supposed to be minor characters like folks living in towns. Lastly, there's no spinner thing in Rayhawk's drawing, which is like the main thing that makes Ninjago different. Mike's theme name wasn't super original, Ninja Ghosts. But Tommy and his buddies decided to put Ninja and Lego together. And bam, we got Ninjago, known all over the place. I'm not saying Tommy didn't get some ideas, like maybe the golden weapons from Mike's thing, but, you know, they worked for the same company so it's not really fair to call it stealing. In 2008, the company felt it needed a new show, and they planned to bring it in as a replacement for the not-yet-out Atlantis. At first, the story and the whole idea for the new series were kind of blurry. They went with ninjas for two big reasons. First off, the company had been tossing around the ninja idea for a bit, and secondly, kids liked it as found in a study the company did to check out what people were into. Superheroes were also in the running, but most of the younger folks in the study were more into Japanese warriors. So making Ninjago a big thing wasn't just one person's doing, but it was a whole company effort. Some folks had the idea for the series, and others in 2009 made it all come together. And here's a fun fact. Regular kids had a say in a lot of the important decisions for the first Ninjago sets. Like, when they were picking who the bad guys should be, there were lots of choices. Monkeys, robots, lizard people, and others. Almost all of them became real LEGO sets in some way, and the lizard people became the biggest group in Ninjago, now called the Serpentine. As you probably know, skeletons won in a vote as the most popular fantasy creatures among kids. These creatures were already a hit in the fantasy era, so making Undead for LEGO wasn't something totally new. They were supposed to release the new stuff in 2010, but because they aimed for super high quality, LEGO decided to hold off and bring it out in 2011. According to the author's plan, Ninjago sets were supposed to make up 10% of the yearly sales. That was a really big goal because, you know, no other LEGO starter set had ever come close to those numbers. Not Bionicle, which saved the company from going under, and not City, always in the top 5 bestsellers. That's why, by the way, the folks who made Ninjago went for it in a much bigger way than, let's say, Pharaoh's Quest. If they had put out the same number of sets for Pharaoh's Quest in 2011, along with a cartoon series like Ninjago, who knows how long Pharaoh would have stuck around. But the authors didn't aim to turn Pharaoh's adventures into a big franchise, unlike Ninjago, where those kinds of plans were on the table. Like I said before, the Spinjitsu, or spinners to be exact, is one of the main things about Ninjago. Sure, spinning tops have been around way before the company started in 32, but the designers turned the familiar toy into a full-on tabletop game with its own rules. They threw in a competitive idea, special game cards, and even extras in the form of booster packs. I think the success of this kind of game was a sure thing even before it came out. But it didn't stop there. Apart from the regular LEGO sets, which turned out to be massive, the creators came up with a bunch of extra stuff to promote their new thing. I'm talking about another board game as part of the gaming scene, an add-on to the video game universe set in the Ninjago world. By the way, they worked on it at the same time as making the sets, so there were lots of differences between them. There were also some promo polybags, a game called Battles for Nintendo DS. They even got the rock band The Fold to make theme music, and they launched a proper animated series called Ninjago Masters of Spinjitsu, starting with such attention to detail, practically guaranteed success. Finally, 
The sets from the new series hit the shelves in January 2011, and as expected, this theme became super successful. They beat the expected goal of 10% of the total revenue, making Ninjago the most profitable starter line in the company's history. Not too long ago, Super Mario had a similar success story. However, the specific numbers about it haven't been shared by the Danes, and it's genuinely unknown whether Ninjago still holds the world record. It's quite possible, given the initial crazy popularity of Mario, while the ninja heroes were unknown to anyone before they hit the big stage. Ninjago instantly became a huge franchise, but originally the authors didn't plan to keep the theme going past 2013. Since the set production cycle takes a while, the development of this period's wave started before Ninjago became a global hit. So not wanting to take too many risks, the authors made the final set lineup as small as possible, fearing the failure of their brainchild. In a nutshell, even though the previous sets were super successful, 2013 didn't have many new products, but you know, it wasn't a disaster, and the creators didn't go all out to stop the money train, they kept the series going into 2014 and beyond. Over these years, more than 300 Ninjago sets popped up, there's a full-length film by Warner Brothers, theme parks worldwide, and loads of team-ups with big names like Adidas, Skybound, McDonald's, and even the Daily Mail. Despite it seeming like people might be losing interest, Ninjago is kicking and alive. LEGO calls it Evergreen, a term they used for themes that aren't closing shop in the next five years. City, Star Wars, Duplo, Technic, Creator, and Friends also fall into this group. Ninjago snagged the sixth spot for the most money-making lines in the first half of 2021. If LEGO isn't rushing to close up Minecraft, Dots, or Monkey Kid, which aren't pulling in similar numbers, then we shouldn't expect Ninjago to call it quits anytime soon. So that's the scoop. Drop your thoughts on the video in the comments. Big thanks to everyone for tuning in. Catch you later.